My name is Miles McCrocklin, and I'm giving you the talk on reusable, reusable visualizations. So, who here has worked with D3 before? Just raise your hand. Awesome. Now, how many of you have taken visualizations that you've used for one project and reused it across multiple uh, projects? Okay, less. Is anyone here actually using D3 in production right now? Okay, great. Well, I just, uh, just to reiterate on what D3 stands for, D3 stands for Data Driven Documents. That it is that it maps the data that you have to the DOM elements or HTML. So, so there, here's some examples of companies that are uh, using D3 in production. You've got Trifacta, Datamir, Periscopic, Square, Simple. New York Times has Mike Bostock and a bunch of other great visual designers. Um, so my talk is going to talk about four things. One, I'm going to talk about the reusable visualization API and step through how to build a specific visualization. I'm going to uh, touch on the difference between uh, using D3 uh, versus like the typical backend MV whatever you have, like Django or Rails. And then I'm going to talk about how to tie in re your reusable chart API very briefly with some front end MV stars frameworks and touch on some resources that are available. So a reusable chart, what is, uh, what is it? Well, it's taking this to something like this. Uh, Chris uh, touched on it, and let's uh, dive in. So I want to build a chart th like this that allows you to select over uh, some elements and do something with them. Just to reiterate, reusable visualizations, this is, comes from a blog post that Mike Bostock gave called uh, that uh, touches on the towards reusable chart. Uh, I won't go into that much detail. Take a look at it if you have time. That said, let's define a problem. We have some data. It's updating via some format. In this case, it's updating by user input. And this data can be queried visually and you can get some kind of value with that. In this scenario, you're getting a sum. It is uh, something that you're probably going to have to do a lot with uh, complex visualizations and complex interop uh, interoperable visualizations. So let's deep dive on how we can create this. Well, Chris talked about how you want to encapsulate your visualization. And you should really leverage a closure for this. Um, and We'll talk more about closures uh, as we move forward. Because right now, you're at the point where you can call your bar chart onto a div. You don't have any data to it. There's nothing uh, else going on. You're not even rendering anything. But you're already at this point. So you already have encapsulated your visualization. So like uh, Chris was mentioning before, you have some width. And let's just say at this point, uh, you, want, you want your bar chart to be 200 pixels, and that's the default. But you want to take it to, I don't know, 800 pixels, and it's ridiculous, um, but this is what you want. You, uh, the idea behind this is that the API can let you have access to that uh, width value, which in this case uh, is in a closure, which a closure closes over the free variables variables which are not local variables for a specific function. And in this scenario, we have width. So width is 800. So we want to create an accessor. And this accessor takes uh, that render dot width and changes uh, width if there is a value in there, if not, returns the width. You saw how it was valuable in the previous talk. Um, so. Moving on, let's think of some other things that we can uh, add uh, into that cl closure. We've got s just basic uh, information, your margins, your width, your height. In this scenario, x value and y value accessors, we'll go more into that a little bit. Also, your chart underpinnings, your brush, your axes, your scales. And then duration of the uh, transitions is an option. And maybe some formatting for numbers, if you'd like. 
so we've gotten to the point where we have the chart underpinnings, we know the width and the height, we know how to build the, um, the closure, but what do, we, what do we do next? Well, we need to render the chart. But where is our data? Our data is bound to a specific div, and it's bound via the datum function. This is a lot different than the dot data function. Dot data binds your data to a, a set of selections, but dot datum binds it to a, oops, sorry, binds that value to a, um, like the entire array to that specific div. So that means that you have all of your data in that div, uh, and it's all accessible. So one, one thing that's pro a problematic, though, is you might have x value and y value not be congruent to what would be what you need to use to visualize your data. In this case, I have IDs and values for, uh, for a set of uh, data. And th these accessors will take a D, which is just an in individual set of, uh, like component of your data set, and return the ID value as the X and the Y, uh, the, the y for D dot value. So we've got the selection, we've got the data, but we don't have the uh, we don't have the data necessarily in the format we want it. There's a variety of ways you can uh, do this to uh, like improve performance. Right now, I'm just going to recommend that you do something greedily first, and then if need to, if you need to, change the implementation later. What is what is happening here is you're converting your data into a standard representation. So you'll take your x values and your y values and create an array that just has d0, x, or, and d1, y. So we've got our data. It's in the format we want it. We've got the selection that we're rendering the data on. We've got all the basic stuff that we want on our closure. But we don't have the skeleton chart. That, that is, like we don't have this, the things necessary to create the chart. So we want to only do this once in order to make the transitions and everything interact well. <coughs> the easiest way to do this once is, well, you could do if not uh, this, uh, this exists, then create it. But you could also leverage D3's uh, system and select the element, the, uh, the div, select all SVGs in it, bind an array of the array of data, which means it's only going to have one element in it. And that means it's only going to enter in once and append an SVG and any, anything you need. In this case, your uh, bar groups, maybe your axes, that kind of thing. So now, a lot of the, a lot of the values that were in our closure need to be updated, if you choose, for the data that's coming in. So I would recommend that you update those values now and then visualize. So what's happening here is your uh, x scale is being changed to the, the, value, the new values that are coming in. So that way you don't have your x scale being uh, not congruent to what you're actually visualizing. This is not always required, but this is something that uh, you want to have at least as an option for your uh, users of the API. So now we're finally at the point where we can visualize something. We're at the point where we can actually do what we did before and visualize our bar chart. All this is doing is following the enter, update, and exit paradigm that's common in D3. That is that it's taking uh, any new data, making a new rectangle in the SVG, classing it to a bar, and then all the new data and all the data that has changed is uh, getting the updated values. So it's just making the bar the size it needs to be. And any old data is t uh, being uh, set to an opacity of 0 and removed. I didn't show the transitions. That's You can look at the code. There's uh, an example. I'll get into that later. Um, there's examples on my blocks, and I'll post these later. So the last thing you have to do, uh, Chris touched on this with dispatch, uh, rebinding values. But you can also do this with reusable components. The brush is one of the most powerful um, interactive components of D3, at least in my opinion. 
and it allows you to bind uh, the on so, uh, value or like the on function to render, which can then say when your chart has uh, a brush interaction, sum up the total in that selected val uh, set. And we're back to visualizing our data. So full circle, we got, uh, we got to a visualization. All right, so this is great. But when you're dealing with a backend MV framework like uh, Django, you're used to this, uh, all of your view data, or all of your view co code being handled in a view on your backend. This is not necessarily congruent anymore. Uh, there's a lot of cases where you don't do this. I'm just going to step through how you'd normally do this. That is, you take your, uh, um, somebody goes to your web page, and then they talk to a controller, which gets some data that it needs to visualize, visualizes it via a model, and gets that HTML, sends that HTML to a browser, and the browser renders. It's great. What happens now, though, is your, your page is rendered, and you're at the point where you have all of your data available. Uh, like You don't have the data that you want to visualize for uh, your D3 visualization. So what happens? Well, you you, uh, your JavaScript starts running. And at some point, there's an uh, asynchronous call to talk to your backend, which will get a model for you, send all that, model, that data to you in some format, in my case, normally JSON, to your JavaScript, which will call a reusable chart. So in this paradigm, you can consider in some form that your reusable chart is a view on that data, and then that uh, will be rendered in, uh, in your browser. Two different uh, concepts, but uh, work pretty nicely together. So how do you do this solely in D3? Well, D3.json. You've probably seen this before. What happens is you uh, take your uh, D3 code, or like take D3.json, go to a specific URL or URI that, uh, to get your data. In this case, controller slash call get model. Not necessarily the best one, but yeah. Um, and then a callback occurs. That is, there's a function that uh, will contain the data for you. That data is in JSON, uh, is that JSON data. You, in this scenario, will bind it to a global variable, call a main, and main will render your chart for you, and you're back to where you were. So front end MV whatever, it's, it's a craze right now. Everyone loves it. Uh, I'm not going to say anything other than I think you really should keep your data visualization code separate from your MV whatever. Why? Well, I'm going to quote Jeffrey here first. D3 is an intentionally a low-level system. During the early designs of D3, we even referred to it as a visualization kernel rather than a toolkit or framework. What does that mean? Well, if you think, uh, think about an operating system, you have a kernel, and that kernel is meant to be uh, completely blocked away from your applications. That abstraction is uh, leaky, so is this, but ideally this is the uh, uh, ideal scenario. Also, Alan Cheung from Square, who uh, uh, created the analytics page for Square, said that Ember.js is the backbone of their new analytics page. While D3, to continue the tortured analogy, is the muscle powering their visualizations. Well, if you think about it, bone and uh, muscle kind of like merging together in some fa form sounds kind of gruesome to me. I don't know. Uh, so I've created a set of examples that will be posted online. You can take a look at it later that create a directive for Angular that allows you to use the reusable chart API and uh, Inter, uh, create the visualization. In this case, um, it's right here. You can take a look at it later. And then there's this allows you to get to the point where you can have a declarative call to your chart. 
This is very powerful. Let your designers take your bar chart and visualize it the way they want. Backbone, get a view, same thing. Ember, a view, the same thing. So I wanted to touch on some of the resources that we have available to us right now. There's, there's this thing called Vega. This is not following the reasonable visualization API. However, it, is what, uh, it creates a visualization grammar. That is, that this is using simply JSON, create, uh, allowing you to visualize your data. No code. This is very, very powerful. Highly recommend, at least right now, to use it to do some rapid prototyping and visualize your data. You can create great visualizations. The problem with this currently is that there's very little interactivity. And it's, very, it's, it's not necessarily designed for something that will be very interactive. You should use this for prototyping initially and then maybe grow into non-interactive, tightly coupled visualizations. There's also NVD3. NVD3 is a reusable, is a instance of the reusable chart API. I highly recommend anyone that's using uh, uh, high charts to switch over to this. There's a lot of great visualizations. Uh, it's fun to work with. Check it out. It's following the same API. Definitely look at it if you want to build your own visualizations that are not necessarily under this, the bias that he, uh, Bob Monteverde has made. And there's also DC.js, which uh, Chris has touched on. This is not following the same reusable chart API paradigm, but it uh, it's built on top of CrossFilter. And what does this mean? This means that you can have tightly coupled visualizations that allow you, you to query across multiple dimensions uh, to understand your data set. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>